So if you could just start, Bill, with telling us a little bit about uh, your background, where you're based, and who you are, really. That would be great. All right. Well, yeah, I'm based here in Dublin, although I wasn't born here. I've only been here about five years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, let me tell you about my history with NLP, because that's what we're talking about, isn't it, really? Uh, back in the 1980s, the mid-1980s, I was the training manager at Manchester Airport. And one yeah. of the things I did there was attend um, a workshop called How to Influence Others at Work. This was in 1988. And uh, this uh, workshop run by a, an Australian psychologist called Dick McCann was uh, about um, how to how to have conversations at work in a way that is helpful and influential with your colleagues. And I went back to his uh, bibliography. This was trainer's training for a model he developed, a model of communication he developed. And fundamentally, what he'd done was taken the meta model and the Milton, well, parts of the Milton model, fragments of it, and and put it into a book explaining how to get on with people at work. So that was my first introduction to NLP. There were 19 NLP books in his bibliography. I went and bought every one of them and studied them avidly from cover to cover and discovered almost overnight my ability to communicate and be effective in my work just multiplied almost astronomically. And uh, so that was my first introduction to NLP and I've been working with it, applying it to the work I do ever since. So it's what, 32, 33 years now. 33 years, yeah, it's quite a long time, isn't it? Yes. And I first met you at the NLP Academy where you were kind of assisting on the the, the uh, NLP trainers training. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. I did that for 13 years. So each year I would join the group and, and be there for six weeks where they ran through a, a practitioner program and coaching program and then the trainers training. And I used to really support the trainers training and uh, I'm working particularly with Spanish speaking people because there were a lot of Spanish speakers and I work equally in Spanish or English. So. Mm. Yeah, because a lot of the training was in the UK and Spain as well. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. So today I would like to talk really about uh, listening and questioning skills. And I know that you uh, are an expert really on uh, specifically the NL, specifically the NLP meta model. Yeah. So could you just give us a little insight as to your version of what the meta model is or what it should be and how it can Absolutely. possibly help people? Well, what many practitioners don't get, uh, don't fully understand in their training yeah. is the, the meta model is the foundation of NLP because uh, the whole thing started really in 1972 when um, John Grind and Richard Bandler, it was really Richard Bandler and Frank Puselik, who'd been observing the work of Fritz Perls, who had recently died, yeah. and discovered that Fritz Perls, just by talking to people, could do things that all the other therapists just couldn't do. Yeah. And Richard Bandler, slightly later, discovered Virginia Satir was doing almost the same thing. Yeah. And like what specifically? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they, they got uh, John Grinder involved because they knew there was something to do with words coming out of people's mouths. But Richard and Frank didn't really have the skill to understand what that was. Yeah. John being a linguist at the time, they said, look, come and watch us and see what we're doing because we're pretending to be Fritz Pearls. We're teaching Gestalt therapy. And these students we've got are better than Pearls himself. And it must be something we're doing that we don't know what. And it must be something that Pearls was doing, but we don't know what. Yeah. So John discovered that Fritz Pearls, Virginia Satir, were able to recognize patterns in the way people explain their thinking, their clients explain their thinking. Yeah. And what they would do is they respond to those ways of thinking in such ways that it forced the client to go back and realize what they were saying. And it kind of, they created a new understanding. So just in conversation, these people were getting better. They, they were making changes that nobody else could help them do. And so yeah. what, what um, John and Richard managed to do was to recognize what were these patterns in people's language that Fritz Pearls and Virginia Satir were responding to. The interesting thing was Pearls and um, Satir didn't know what they were responding to. They were doing it intuitively. Yeah. So Fritz Pearls talks about a feeling in his gut. He, he said, when I get this feeling in my gut, I say, 
what exactly do you mean? And so yeah. that was that was how they observed that these people could hear patterns in people's language that nobody else noticed. Yeah. And, and when they challenged those patterns and, and got the client to go back and reevaluate what they just said and what they meant. Yeah. Then the changes were were happening spontaneously. So that was the birth of the meta model because John being a linguist was able to observe those patterns and then actually codify what they were. Yeah. Um, and that led to a whole string of recognition of certain patterns that almost everybody uses in their everyday speech, which became the meta model. So the meta model itself is really the coding of those language patterns. Yeah. So the meta model is really about drilling down into the specifics rather than going into the abstract of unpacking the mental furniture, so exactly. to speak. So yeah. using linguistics to drill down into the detail of what the problem really is. Yeah, exactly. Or, or rather to help the client go back and see, it is a, another thing they discovered was our language is a representational system. In other words, we represent the world and, and everything that goes on our experiences. Yeah inside of us in pictures, sounds, smells, tastes, and feelings. And then when we have a thought and we want to speak our thought, what we have to do is label it. We have to put words on it. Yeah. Uh, so what, what um, John Grinder as a linguist and Noam Chomsky, his boss at the time was yeah. studying was how does a human being translate a thought into speech? Um, what's the mechanism? What happens? And so John was using this understanding, this study, to help people recognize that when you have a thought and then you speak your thought, the words that come out of your mouth are only a part of the entire thought. If you ask the person to specify what they mean when they say they have a problem, what is the problem exactly? Yeah. Then they'll have to go back and work out, yeah, what is the problem? And then they'll come up with a more complete explanation. And that more complete explanation helps the client themselves to understand themselves more. And that yeah. was really. Well, one of the things I've heard about the meta model is, uh, is people possibly erroneously um, labeling it as the opposite to the middle, the Milton model. Mm. What, what's your take on that? Well, the, the way that works is the meta model was, was the birth of NLP. So John and Richard had already worked out and written the book called The Structure of Magic, Volume 1, yeah. uh, about the meta model. And when Gregory Bateson introduced them to Milton Erickson, who was this amazing hypnotist and hypnotherapist, um, what they noticed Erickson was doing, although Erickson didn't explain it because he didn't have it explicit in his mind, was that Erickson would notice the way words come out of people's mouths, these patterns. He would notice them more consciously than Pearls and Satir did. Yeah. But what Erickson would do is recognize that because of the way people speak with all these vague notions, um, the listener has to interpret what they're saying. And to interpret, you go inside your consciousness and you search unconsciously for the meaning of what you're guessing at. Yeah. So that's, the way, that's the mechanism for interpreting. So what Erickson would do would force people to do that. He would force them to guess what he was saying yeah. so that they would go inside because when you go when your attention goes inside it, it's like you drop into a trance you're not yeah. you're disconnected from the outside world and you're in a trance and so he would create trances by deliberately distorting generalizing and deleting what he was yeah. saying and so in order to do that he had no choice but to use the very same patterns that people use naturally to speak their their thoughts. I don't know if that's making sense. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I just think that a lot a lot of people think that the Milton model is all about chunking up and abstracting. But the Milton model is a lot of different models, isn't it? It works on different levels on provocation, mm -hmm. on um, abstract, but also chunking down as well. Yeah, although what what Milton Erickson would do, you see, he would recognise that. Um, when when someone would say, let's say they they distort or they they delete some information, so say I have a problem and I'm trying to deal with it. Yeah, well, that sounds pretty specific. But what you don't know, what you're having to guess is, well, what kind of problem are we talking about? Out of all the problems that they've ever been, which one are you talking about? 
And when you say you're finding it difficult, well, how does that work? What, what's difficult about it? And so yeah. what Ericsson would do is say, you know, you're sitting there and you're thinking about your problem, aren't you? And you have no idea how, do you? And so he's just used the same pattern, but on purpose. And of course, then you, the listener, have to go and think, yeah, problem. Yeah, what is the problem? How? How, <laughs> how what? How? Yeah. Uh, and so all of that processing that you're having to do puts you deeper and deeper into a, a trance, which was yeah. the vehicle that Ericsson was using in order to help you make changes. And so really, the reason that the Milton model relates so closely to the whole of the meta model is because it, it really is using the language that the meta model challenges. Yeah. Ericsson uses it on purpose. So he's, instead of chunking down and getting more specific, he's deliberately staying non-specific in order yeah. to force this guessing game and yeah. then to force the trance that goes with it. Yeah. So, so it's all what, about locating lost information in different ways. That's right. And the meta model is about uncovering it and bringing it into consciousness. But with Milton, it's about keeping it in unconsciousness. In fact, driving it deeper into unconsciousness in order to get the therapeutic trance that he intended. Yeah, I really like that term, driving it deeper into unconsciousness. <laughs> yeah, unconscious solutions. Brilliant. Mm. So do you have any examples or tidbits or, ta or takeaways for people that they could use within this group like just like a, a one minute or a five minute thing that people could actually use regarding the 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 listening skills that you're good at or the meta model mm. well well one thing is I, I do have a little um ebook that people could download free i can tell you a bit more about yeah, that i've um, heard about that it sounds very good background yeah yeah um so so that's one easy way but for example you know most people that have learned something about NLP have these notions that some of the things that we do when we speak our thoughts is we miss information out, we delete some information, we generalize some information, or we distort some information, we change it in some way. Yeah. Remember that with their language, what we're doing is we're painting a picture of what we're thinking in words that comes out of our mouth. And so someone might say, you know, I could do with some help. I'm really struggling and I don't know what to do. Now, think about what that forces you to guess. I, I need some help. Uh, I'm really struggling and I don't know what to do. So you think, well, what kind of help do you need, right? Yeah. Because you realize you have to guess. Otherwise, you're thinking, oh, I know what he needs help with. <laughs> How could you possibly know that? And so, yeah. so you're having to guess. And so then you say, hmm, so you need some kind of help. What kind of help do you need? I mean, is it money? Is it time? Is it equipment? What is it? Um, and when you say you're finding it difficult, what is it that you're finding difficult? Yeah. Because <laughs> um, you said it, but what's it? Um, yeah. So you need some help with it because it's difficult. How is it difficult then? What, yeah. what is it and how is it difficult? And so yeah. when you realize that you're having to guess those things in order to understand, yeah. then you can notice that the question that you could ask is obvious. It doesn't need a lot of working out. Yeah. So, so that's the way it works, really. It, so when someone s says something vague, like, I need some help, you automatically realise you're guessing what kind of help he must be talking about, and you ask the question, what help do you need? Yes. Yeah. I think so, one, of, one of the deletions that crops up time and again, uh, usually when people don't have any kind of knowledge or backup on a subject matter, is when people say, it is what it is. Yeah. It is what it is. And I always want to ask, well, what is it, right? <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. So for yeah. me, that's like a great example of a, a deletion. Yeah, a huge uh, deletion, isn't it? Because basically there's no information in there at all. Yeah. Except, of course, the context in which your conversation is taking place. Yeah. You know, so somebody might say, well, it is what it is because they're saying, look, I've got no money. I can't pay my rent. I'm stuck. I'm in a really bad place. But, <laughs> That's life. It is what it is. I'll get over it. 